I am uh, <clears throat> going to talk about global warming revisited. The reason it's revisited, I got introduced to global warming here in Lindau. And I was in a panel discussion in 2008. And it was a panel discussion about global warming. And I didn't really want to, partic to participate. But uh, they said you really had to. And so I spent maybe half a day or a day or so looking at Google. And I was horrified by what I found. And so I got interested in global warming a little bit. And because I was on this uh, panel discussion, I looked at uh, Google and I looked at Gaber and global warming because I'd been on one panel discussion. And I got roughly 40,000 results. If I look at my mind and look at my name and say Gaber and superconductivity, I got much fewer results. <laughs> global warming is really a hot topic. And what I said then, and which I still believe, is that global warming really has become a new religion. Because you can't discuss it. It's not proper. If you say global, see if you see if you look at Linda here today, then all the people who are, you know, notable people, they have said climate change in their talks. All of them have said it. I don't know whether they know what they mean, but they have said it anyway. Everybody talks about climate change. So the American Physical Society, which I was a member, said the evidence is incontrovertible that global warming exists. Now, think about that. This is a physical society. And they say you cannot discuss global warming because we believe it's happening. It's like the Catholic Church. There are lots of incontrovertible truths in the Catholic Church, I'm sure. And here there's an incontrovertible truth in a physical society. So the only, only answer to that is to resign. So and that actually made quite a much more story than I thought it would have. So it really, global warming really starts with due to these two people, Al Gore and Paul Curry, or however you pronounce it. And what they did, they made this curve popular. I know that's hard to read from the audience, but on the vertical scale is degrees in 0.1 degree, so roughly one degree is the whole vertical scale. And the horizontal scale is in years from 1860 to 19 or to 2000. And you see, the global warming has increased, but the fact the scale is like the, what well, dentists use when they advertise by you know, dent toothpaste, because the scale is absolutely distorted. I mean, there's one degree there. And so what does this curve measure? Well, this curve measures what does the, the average temperature for the world for a whole year and for a whole, whole Earth, for one year. So there's an average temperature for the whole Earth for one year, and that measures in a fraction of a degree. So what does that mean? I think probably nothing. So let me talk about that again. From 1880 to 2017, the temperature has increased from 288 to 288.83 Kelvin, 0.3%. I think the temperature has been amazingly stable. If I take where I live in Albany, New York, there are roughly 80 degree K difference between summer and winter at some time. And so would you think that 0.8 degree average on the Earth makes any difference to the climate in Albany? Is that s sensible to you? Oh, the wrong way. So here is then where the temperature is measured. And you see there's point on the graph. So if you can read that, in the north of 60 degrees is 167 measurements between uh, 
30 and 60 degrees is quite, quite a lot of measurements. The United States is all covered with things and stuff. So if you go, if you go finally to the South Pole, there are eight thermometers, <laughs> according to NASA. That's all they have, including the South Pole, eight thermometers. And so if you had eight thermometers to measure the average temperature in Germany, where would you put those eight thermometers? You know, eight thermometers for the continent. It's nothing. And the fact is, as I, as I deal with the South Pole, there had never been as cold on the South Pole as it is right now. There's more ice than there ever have been. And so, but people don't talk about that. They talk about the North Pole, where they have a warmer climate at the present time. And the other thing which upset me is that what is the optimum temperature for the Earth? Is that the temperature we have right now? That would be a miracle. Maybe it's two degrees warmer. Maybe it's two degrees colder. But nobody has told me what the optimal temperature is for the whole Earth. This is a little bit like American foreign policy. The foreign policy wants things to be as they are because we have it good in the United States. And, uh, but even the foreign policy can't control the climate. The other thing is that both the alarmists and the deniers, I guess I'm quoted as a denier, measures the average temperature for the whole, for the whole Earth for a whole year at to a fraction of a degree. And that result is significant. Of course it's not. How can you possibly measure the average temperature for the whole Earth and for the whole year and come up with a fraction of a degree? So I have this slide here. I think the average temperature of the Earth is equal to the emperor's new clothes. Was a, was a boy who said, you know, cried, that's my, the emperor has no clothes on. And I would cry out and say, you can't measure the temperature for the whole earth by such accuracy. I was in Beijing in, I think it was in 74 or 75, and Beijing was a village. There were three or four cars there, and we had control of one of them. I was back in Berlin, uh, in, uh, in uh, Beijing, like a few years ago, and you can't cross the streets for cars. And there's buildings which are like 30, 40 stories high everywhere. And so what, what had that done with the temper for, for Beijing, you think? I mean, and if you think, if you think that when you measure temperature in the, to 1900, the thermometer was standing sort of in the countryside, and now we go 1910, the more dense population density, and then the thermometers broke, you got new thermometers. And how can you think that I can measure this to a fraction of a degree? It's ridiculous. Now, this is the, what they have come up with, however, and this is for the last 19 years, roughly speaking, the temperature has not gone up. It's been constant for 19 years almost as long as the life of the students here. They're probably at 23, 24 years old. So it hasn't gone up. And there was a big peak in 98, that's very recognizable. So what, what did the people who measure temperature do with that? Well, here is the latest temperature they have measured now, and they see the curve here, and if you look at the edge here, it goes up. I made a bit better one here. So the temperature here goes up. How can that be when I just showed you the other curve, the temperature has been constant? Well, the reason for that is that they include now the ocean. But for 100 years, the ocean has not been included. Why do you think they include the ocean? Because it's more accurate or because they can fiddle with the data? And that's what NASA does. So Obama said last, uh, last year that 2014 was the hottest year ever. But it's not true. It's not the hottest year. So if you don't, if you don't believe I'm cheating you, here's some satellite data. And this is the peak in 98. And you see basically the satellite data shows the same thing. The temperature has not increased. So 
what is then a greenhouse effect? Well, without the atmosphere, the Earth would have been roughly 35 degree warmer, roughly speaking. Now, from 19. 98 to, to, from, from 1898 to 1998, the temperature has increased 0.8 degrees. And the CO2 concentration has increased from 295 to, to 367, or roughly 72 parts per million in 100 years. That's what has happened. That's the fact. I'm not making this up. Now from 1998, which is basically the hottest year, the CO2 has increased from 367 to 403, four or, or in, in well, roughly 36 parts per million. That's half of the previous increase. So why hasn't the temperature increased 0.4 degrees then? I mean, if you're a physicist, for heaven's sake, and here's the experiment, and you have a theory, and the theory doesn't agree with the experiment, then you have to cut out the theory. You were wrong with the theory. See, that's half the thing. It should have been, but it isn't. So you can't believe then the people who are, the alarmists said that CO2 is a terrible thing, and, it, and therefore you have to not drive and use solar cells and stuff, because otherwise the world will go to pot. But it's not true. It's absolutely not true. So nature, in its wisdom, uh, this was happened actually in 2012, when I gave another talk in Global Warming here, has come up with a magazine. And they want to cash in on the fad. My friend said I shouldn't make fun of nature because then I won't publish my papers. But, but I don't publish my papers anyway, so I'm safe there. <laughs> so they had an article in there, for example, that corn Yield in, Af in uh, Africa decreased 1% for each day over 30 degree Kelvin. See, that's a very difficult thing to determine. But they published that article anyway. There was nothing saying in nature that in the United States we put 10% alcohol into gasoline. That's the most stupid program America ever done. But all the gasoline should have 10% ethanol in it. And that comes from corn as well from corn grown in Iowa, I guess, and that's food. So for re reason we do this, that food is much more expensive now because we do this. It's, uh, it's very costly and very stupid. But that's what the United States, sometimes the United States do stupid things. And nobody mentioned nature how important the CO2 is for plant growth. If you have more CO2, the plant grows faster. People use greenhouses and put CO2 in greenhouses to get a higher yield. But now, since the CO2 has increased, we get more plant and more, more but grows faster. It's a wonderful thing, but they don't talk about that in nature. And also, nobody says big trees here in Lindau, for example, the beautiful trees are actually starving. But when, when a plant developed photosynthesis, there was much more carbon dioxide in the air. And so they could use much more, but, but there isn't any. So the plants are really starving. But they don't talk about how good it is for agriculture that CO2 is increasing. Eric, here's another thing from nature, which, that you, just to show you how ridiculous things are. There's a guy here, who says, or the guy, a girl, I don't know, that the, shrink, the, the, the shrinking victims because of the global warming is cotton, corn, strawberries, etc. These are things that get smaller because of global warming. So I, I, I read out strawberries here because they grow strawberries in Italy and they grow strawberries in Norway. I never seen any difference in the size of the strawberries grown in Italy and Norway, but apparently they are. And if you're going to make a statement on that, how many strawberries has to count and weigh and deal with? See, it's ridiculous. And then it says here, herring is also smaller. But we've catch a lot of herring in Norway. I never heard anybody say that. But they claim that all these things, lynx, wood rats, squirrels, shrimp, scallop, cotton, corn, everything gets smaller because of global warming. Published in Nature. So unfortunately, it is not true for people. <laughs> so, 
That's a... So here's another one. Here's a... See, all this you can do, which I did when I went on that, on that panel discussion. Here they say melting Greenland. And you look at that picture it's carefully done, some people standing in the ice, and a river flowing off, and you think Greenland will disappear. But the information on the internet, which is wonderful, and I looked it up, there are four harbors in Greenland. And this is the name of the harbors, I won't tell you, announce them, pronounce them, but you see the coldest years uh, are, include 1992, 1997, and so on. The, the one on the here are the coldest years. And here are the warmest years. As so the warmest years, basically, the 1930. And those are the fact. Those are the temperature the people in the harbors in Greenland has measured over the years. And it doesn't look like it's getting any warmer. I mean, I don't understand it. Where, where do the data come from? Who says what this is? Now, of course, global warming is supposed to cause the climate change. That's what it was. But the climate changes anyway. The climate has always changed. But the people who believe in global warming said the recent climate changes is because of global warming. And the, it's the, the World Metropolitan Organization said you need 30 years to determine the climate. So this is a difficult slide to see here, but this is the rainfall in lots of places all over the world. But if we focus on this one here, this is the dust bowl in the, in the Midwest in, in the 30s. You see, we have a dust bowl there. And you look at the here in Africa, the huge amount of rain. The, the, the climate has changed everywhere, all the time. And that was before we talked about global warming. And the, the people in the dust bowl, people know how to move to California. So the, the Steinbeck wrote the story of the grape of, the grape of rot about that. It was a very wonderful story. And so this has happened all the time, happened everywhere. And it's nothing to do with global warming. So when I ask people then, why is the climate change? Why? And temperature has not changed. So why do they talk about it? Another thing which amazes me really is that when they talk about climate change, it's always to the worse. See, the climate also changes to the better. And if climate changes, you have a 50% chance anyway. You've got to be better someplace for heaven's sake. It can't always be to the worst. So then comes the clincher. If climate change doesn't work to scare people, they can scare people talking about extreme weather. That must work. So here is the extreme weather. And, and uh, the question is, is the ocean level rising? Uh, here is a graph, it's hard to see, but you sit again. But this scale is in thousands of years, and this scale this is in meters. If you look at the recent scale, and you see it here, this scale down, you can maybe read that, and this scale here is in centimeters. And for the last hundred years, the ocean has risen 20 centimeters. But for the previous hundred years, it also rose to 20 centimeters. And for the free, last 300 years, ocean has written free 20 centimeters a hundred years. And so there is no unusual rise in the sea level. And to be sure you understand that, I'll repeat it. There is no <laughs> unusual sight in the sea level. And here is then is the hurricanes in the United States for 150 years. Hurricanes are supposed to be much worse now because of the weather has gotten 0.8 degrees warmer. I mean, on the average. But you see, there are no such thing. If anything, we've entered the period of low hurricanes. See, these are the facts. I don't make up these facts. And actually, when I gave this, I gave this talk in Linda in 2012, the criticism I got, I'd never published anything in global warming. But you don't have to publish things. You don't have to even be a scientist to look at these figures. And you understand what it says. And the same thing here is for the tornadoes in the United States. It looked like they're in a low period in the last few years. That's only 50 years of data or so. But see, what people say is not true. 
I talked to a journalist yesterday from d site and he's supposed to be here, I don't know whether he's here or not, and I asked how many articles he published but, but this says that a global warming is a good thing. And they probably don't publish that at all. It's always negative. Always. So here is a picture. See how ridiculous things do. I hate to make fun of Norway because I'm Norwegian, but I think I can deserve this anyway. There is, there is an oil platform laying about there. That is 200 miles from the coast of Norway. It's an oil platform. It's a very, very lucrative oil platform. And what they're going to do with that, they're going to electrify it. On the platform, of course, they have lots of uh, natural gas and they have gas turbines and stuff. There's no problem with power. But to save on the platform, they, to save for the carbon dioxide on the platform, they're going to electrify it from land. It costs billions of money, crowns anyway, a huge amount of money. But the government of Norway has decided that. Hopefully now, when the oil price has fallen by a factor or two, maybe they reconsider. I hope that. Because what they're going to do, all the gas they save by not using gas uh, uh, generators, gas generators, they're going to send to Europe. What is Europe going to do with the gas? Burn it, of course. So, I mean, there's no saving here. They're just an expense. There's no saving of CO2 or anything. It's just, it's just ridiculous. So here is now what I worry about very much is the conference going to be in Paris in November. And, and I really worry about that. Because the, the conference was in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen, that almost became a disaster, but nothing got decided. But now I think the, the, the people who are alarmists have a very strong position. And so the physical society always have made up their mind, so I don't have to worry about them. And now let's look at what they say. The evidence is incorrigible. Global warming is occurring if no mitigation is taken, significant disruption of Earth's physical and the cloud system, and so on. Everything is going to hell. But the facts are that in the last 100 years or so, we have measured the temperature. It has gone up 0.8 degrees, and everything in the world has gotten better. See? So how can they say it's going to get worse? When, when, when we have the evidence that if it's true that they can mesh, at least they believe it, when the temperature has gone up 0.8 degree, everything we live longer, we have better work, better health, better everything. But if we go, if we go another 0.8 degrees, we're going to die, I guess. So here is then what, they sh what we should worry about. This is refugees trying to cross the Mediterranean. And so this is a boat, and these people are not fleeing from global warming, they're fleeing from poverty. If we want to help Africa, we should help them out of poverty, not, you know, try to build solar cells and windmill. Here's another tragic picture, but this, these are uh, uh, Syrian refugees. There are supposed to be five million of them. And are, you know, I ask you, are you wasting money on the climate like solar cell and windmills rather than helping people. See, these people, when, when you spend, I look at Linda here, there are a lot of solar cells on the roof. These people have been misled. It costs money to do that. And so, and, and windmill costs money. So here is a very nice, I know I can't convince you by speaking here, but I can show you this, this book that's called The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. It's a wonderful book. Actually, his main point is that uh, we have it so good today because the, we are the only ape with barters, with trades. Human, as an ape anyway, they trade. No other animals do that. That's why we have taken this, so, we have so much advanced from other animals. And he also talked about the, but, but we change, we could change from animal power to, to uh, steam engine and so on, and then we can go to coal, and then we can go to oil, and we get cheap energy. And cheap energy is what has made us so rich. And now suddenly people don't want it anymore. See, they, we should continue. And people say the oil companies are the big bad people. I don't understand why they are worse than the windmill companies. 
General Electric made windmills. They don't tell you it's not economical because they make money on it. But, it, but it, nobody pr protests, but they protest to Exxon who makes oil. I mean, they're very good companies, but their companies are efficient and that's why we have it so nice today. So here is a statement by Obama. He gave a recent speech at the college in the United States and he said, no challenge poses a greater threat to future generation than climate change. That's what he said. That's a ridiculous statement. See, the United States probably kills maybe a few hundred people a day. They probably have killed a million or several million people the last 10 years or so. We've been at war. And the biggest problem Obama faces is climate change. How, how can he say that? And I say this to Obama, excuse me, Mr. President, but you're wrong. See, he's dead wrong. And I said that once, in a, in a, I was part of an ad in a Time magazine, and I said the same thing. Because he, he, I think Obama is a clever person, but he gets bad advice. And in global warming, he's all that. See, I would say that the global warming basically is a non-problem. Just leave it alone, take care of itself. I get to give you one example of that, and this is a little difficult, but I got it from a man named Elon Sampson, and he said consider a large room, 20 by 20 by 10 feet. That's a large living room. And now I want to seal this room off from the rest of the world. And in the rest of the world, you have all these evil cars who have exos and spew out carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the question he raises then is, is after one year, when this room has been sealed off, how many matches do you have to light in this room to catch up with, with uh, the cars? Any guesses on that? Probably nobody wants to guess that, but if you take this room and so many matches you have to light, you have, if you light one single match, it brings the room up to 20 years of driving. 20 years, one match in a big room. It's the same number of carbon dioxide as all the cars in the world, which is a billion cars. Physicists are very good at this calculation. I was worried about when I got this letter from him and I checked it, and on the internet you can find how many cars in the world, you can find how much they drive, and you can find all sorts of things. So you see, it, it's just one of these things. And, and, and it's, it's hard for me, it's really very hard for me to understand that almost every government in Europe, and, and, and except I think Polish government, are worried about global warming. It must be politics. So finally then, I, I think that what we really have to do, we have to learn to live with change. If climate changes, climate has always changed, we can't control that, so there's nothing we can do. And here is a picture of me and my wife when we got married 60 years ago. And here you can see how we have changed. And we have to live with that. And also you see that what we changed, we have a color photo now, see? was in color when we got married, so that's a change. And I will also say, we, so far we have left the world in a better shape than when we arrived, and this will continue, with one exception. We have to stop wasting huge, and I mean huge amount of money on global warming. We have to do that. But that may take us backwards. See, it's the people think that things are sustainable, but they're not sustainable. So, anyway, that was all I was going to say, so thank you very much.